Uh, welcome to an evening lecture for a change. We have not been shy at connecting with lectures abroad, and you will remember Professor Simons of McMaster University, Ontario, last year. Tonight we're traversing to British Columbia's Simon Fraser University, where it is morning. I rather thought up the topic of magnetism in the early universe as something I really did not know anything about, and so I was worried that it was somewhat off the wall, but not a bit of it. It turns out that Professor Pogosian has been dealing with just that subject and can set it in the right context for us. I should also say that starting with one tentative contact at Portsmouth University, within 48 hours I had got an acceptance from Professor Pogosian who was visiting professor there at the time. The Portsmouth Institute of Cosmology and Gravitation's, Gravitation's efficiency is well noted. We always ask our speakers for an image to illustrate their talk. I hope you will agree that what we have this evening is intriguing and far removed from the iron filings on paper we might have seen at school. Tonight's lecture will open new horizons. As you know, uh, these uh, lectures uh, are recorded and will be available later on Facebook. If during the lecture you have a question, please put it in the Q&A box or you can raise general issues in the chat. So over to British Columbia and Professor Pogosian. Thank you, Marcus, for the kind introduction. Um, let me share my screen and hopefully it will work. Okay, and let's go to full screen. How is this? Is it? Uh, it's good. It's good. Okay. Well, uh, good evening, everyone. I'm uh, here in Vancouver, British Columbia, and it's a very nice way for me to start my morning. It's 10 o'clock in the morning. And uh, the, the picture you see on the title slide is that of the university where I work. I'm currently located in, I don't know if you can see my cursor as I move, but I'm somewhere in this cluster of buildings in the physics department. And far ahead, you see the downtown Vancouver, uh, surrounded by the Pacific Ocean. Um, so Marcus was looking for somebody to talk about primordial magnetic fields. And in general, the topic of cosmic magnetic fields is one of the, I would say, more controversial and more interesting and intriguing topics in astrophysics and cosmology. So uh, it's also a very uh, broad topic with many problems of different kinds. So I hope in this uh, 45 minute talk, I'll give you a flavor for uh, what we know and what we don't and what are the interesting things that make us so excited about this topic. So I'll start with sort of a basic introduction into the physics of magnetic fields that I'm sure most of you know and then go over observations of magnetic fields in space, starting from planets, stars, and galaxies, clusters of galaxies, and voids, which will bring us to the, uh, this topic of primordial magnetic fields, a, a hypothesis that ultimately, uh, as far as large-scale magnetic fields, such as magnetic fields in galaxies, cluster of galaxies, and voids, they could have come from the very early universe. And then um, it will uh, bring us to a more recent thing that I uh, worked on, uh, uh, which concerns the Hubble tension. It turns out that primordial magnetic fields could help reconcile uh, a crisis in modern cosmology, which is a disagreement on how fast the universe is expanding. And then I'll conclude with a very brief uh, kind of a summary and um, overview of things that we can anticipate in the near future. So let's start with magnetic fields that we understand that you would learn at school. So magnetic fields are generated whenever you have motion of electric charges. So whenever you have an electric current, 
that produces a magnetic field and that goes under the name of Ampere's law. Faraday discovered then that you can generate electric fields from magnetic fields if you make magnetic fields change in time. And then Maxwell uh, put, uh, put all the laws of electromagnetism into one unified form and completed this theory by also uh, discovering that electric fields, when they change in time, they can also generate magnetic fields. So this well-known Maxwell's equation describe uh, electromagnetism completely, and there are no real questions or puzzles surrounding it. It's been working very well for uh, over a hundred years. And just, uh, yeah, and also particles. I mean, you, you can uh, have magnetic fields produced by currents and through some dynamos, etc. But you elementary particles like the electron and also atoms, they have their magnetic moments we could think of them as kind of currents, like electrons spin, you could think of a cloud of charge spinning, but it's not really exactly accurate. It's better to think of it as an intrinsic, like a bar magnet that's built into an electron. So to guide your intuition for the rest of the talk, a typical units, uh, so units of magnetic field that we use are Gauss or Tesla. So one Tesla is 10,000 Gauss. And something like a fridge magnet would be 50 Gauss. Um, uh, something that you would need to lift a car at the factory would require around one Tesla. And the, the most powerful man-made magnets on Earth uh, range from 10 to maybe 100 Tesla. Um, so in comparison, magnetic fields of planets and stars are generally smaller on average, but they can also be extremely high. So for example, the magnetic field of planet Earth is about half a Gauss. And uh, it's quite complicated. There's nothing simple about uh, magnetic fields of celestial bodies, but fundamentally there is no puzzle about it. It's not surprising that the Earth has a magnetic field. Uh, there are currents in a liquid iron core, which is ionized, and ionized means it has electric charges. So they move in some complicated way due to convection, due to temperature gradients, etc. And plus, there is a rotation of the Earth. So those are all the right conditions you need to generate magnetic fields. The Sun also has a magnetic field, which we know is very important. It's, all, it's a source of all kinds of uh, trouble. Sometimes we get this uh, magnetic storms that cause communication disruptions. Um, but on average, it's actually not very strong. On the surface of the, of the sun, the field is about uh, one Gauss. Although, again, it's very complicated and has all kinds of turbulence going on. And like the magnetic field of uh, planets, it's not surprising that it's there. All the conditions in stars are such that you would expect magnetic fields to be continuously produced. And an extreme stellar magnetic field is seen in neutron stars. So those are remnants of stars like ours, like the sun. After they burn their fuel, they basically have a few options. One is to collapse into a black hole. Another is to collapse into a neutron star, which is something extremely massive, but super dense, something that would be as let's say a kilometer in, in radius, but have the mass of the whole sun. So because of this compression, and they also start spinning faster and faster as they collapse, the magnetic fields that used to be magnetic fields of the star, they amplify by an enormous amount to or something like 10 to the 11 Tesla. And there are even stronger magnetic fields in objects called magnetars that are uh, even stronger. But again, this is not a puzzle. It's complicated, but it's not surprising. It gets more interesting and less uh, clear once you move on to galaxies. So it's been possible to observe magnetic fields of galaxies since late 1950s. Uh, it's done through radio astronomy. So you could observe things like synchrotron radiation, which is caused by electrons spinning 
in the presence of a magnetic field and spinning electrons emit synchrotron radiation. So uh, there are other ways as well. So it's, it's pretty much universally seen that micro Gauss fields reside in um, micro Gauss, so 10 to minus six Gauss uh, level magnetic fields reside in pretty much all galaxies where we could measure magnetic fields. Um, the extent, the, the pattern of this magnetic field in spiral galaxies is kind of uniform over the extent of the galaxy, like you see on this picture on the bottom. Uh, it's not completely random. It's not like magnetic fields are completely tangled. Uh, there is a smooth large scale component that kind of follows the spiral pattern in this uh, picture. In elliptical galaxies, it's more random. So there is less of a large scale structure, but still in all kinds of galaxies, whether they are elliptical or spiral, whether they're young or old, the strength of the magnetic field is universally around a few micro gauss. So the that is not the so the reason why it's so universally the same and that it's observed in all galaxies is not quite clear. And let me explain why. So first, in case you haven't thought a great deal about galaxies, which I, it's not my area of research, I just uh, sort of follow it as a, an interested party, but. Uh, I guess a natural question to ask is where that magnetic field leaves. What is it that supports the magnetic field? For example, in the Earth's case, the magnetic field is produced by the currents in the iron core. Uh, so you could say magnetic field is re residing in the iron. So where is the magnetic field of the galaxy residing? It resides in essentially the plasma that fills the galaxy. So a lot of the galactic matter is in the form of gas. And there is also dust, which is ionized and can support a magnetic field. So magnetic fields are very happily existing in plasmas. It's a conducting medium where they can, once they are there, they would stay. Also galaxies have stars, which have their own magnetic fields and they can also link up with the magnetic fields that resides in the plasma. So altogether a galaxy provides a, a nice, and a happy environment for magnetic fields to live in. The question is not whether they are, they are conditions to support a magnetic field. The question is more of uh, where did these magnetic fields come from to start with? So that's the puzzle, okay? And that brings us to this topic of the dynamo, which is the dominant or the predominant um, proposal for understanding the physics of magnetic fields in the galaxy. So if you Google dynamo, you will uh, find that a dynamo is something that converts kinetic energy into magnetic. And then if you want to get more technical and you go to Wikipedia, then Wikipedia says that uh, dynamo is a process through which a rotating, convecting, and electrically conducting fluid can maintain a magnetic field. So if you look at the galaxy and look at this definition of a dynamo, all the conditions are there. A galaxy is rotating, we all know that. It is conducting, which is what we just said, that it's, um, it has plasma and plasma is a conducting medium. It is convecting, so convection here means that there are flows of matter, which is in this case ionized, in response to something like temperature differences, pressure differences, so there is motion of matter other than the overall rotation of the galaxy. So there is the rotation and in addition, there is some uh, convection, some motion of conducting material around. And galaxies are full of such motions. Uh, there are uh, all kinds of turbulent flows happening in a galaxy, supernova explosion, galactic winds, uh, and at the very least, the, the rotation of the galaxy is not actually uniform throughout all of the sort of radi radius of the galaxy. At different radii, it rotates at slightly different rates uh, due to friction that caused by electromagnetic interaction in the plasma. So there is convection and we know there is a magnetic field. So if, you know, it can maintain a magnetic field. The puzzle is 
that we don't really understand what seed it is field. So for the dynamo to work, you have to put the magnetic field in first. If you start with a zero magnetic field, there is no dynamo. So you need a seed. And all the big deal about the, uh, the old puzzle of where magnetic fields in galaxy came from concerns the seed. So it's possible that the seed came from just a purely astrophysical uh, reason for through an astrophysical mechanism. And there is a, a, a well-known a uh, example of that called the Biermann battery. So it builds on the fact that in the plasma, which is neutral, so let's first appreciate that a plasma is, is a gas of ionized particles. So particles are electrons and ions. So they're negatively and positively charged, but overall it's neutral. There is an equal number of positive and negative charges. But electrons are much lighter than the ions. So an electron is much lighter than, for example, a proton. So if there is a pressure difference or temperature difference, something that causes electrons to move from one place to another, because they are much lighter, they will move faster they will accelerate faster than um, the ions. And when you separate the charges, if let's say electrons momentarily move uh, away from the protons, then locally you would produce an electric field. The separation of positive and negative charges would produce an electric field. And then that electric field may change or have certain vorticity in it uh, because uh, there is, uh, for example, gravity, there are gravitational potentials due to concentrations of mass in something like a galactic halo. So if electric field develops a vortical pattern, then according to Maxwell, uh, they will generate magnetic fields. So Biermann battery is sort of a broad uh, mechanism through which you could imagine such seed magnetic fields being produced through pure astrophysics through motion of electric and uh, electric charges. Also in the galaxy, there are events like supernovae which eject the magnetic field of the star. Once it dies, the magnetic field remains embedded in whatever explosion remnant uh, you have. And that could spread over vast distances through the galaxy and contained magnetic field that could also help see the galactic uh, magnetic field. So what's the problem then? Why it's not enough? It, it, it may be enough, okay? So I'm not here to make the claim that um, it's not enough. It's just that um, so far, a complete story has not been proposed. So there, there were papers and um, sort of examples of explicit simulations where galactic magnetic fields were explained through these fields, through this astrophysical mechanism for particular types of galaxies. But uh, it may be that such seeds may not be strong enough to explain all of the observed galaxies or galactic fields. In particular, very young galaxies. There are galaxies we see at high redshifts, which are uh, so young that they only had time to turn a handful of times. So Dynamo wouldn't have much time to operate in such young galaxies. Yet their magnetic field is also a few microgauss. So this um, kind of uncertainty about the seed of the galactic magnetic field made people think of a primordial origin. And uh, that was uh, first as far as I know, discussed by Fred Hoyle in 1958, who observed that the seed required to explain micro Gauss level magnetic fields that were then seen in galaxies is just not, is not strong enough. So he hypothesized that there should be primordial magnetic fields already existing in the early universe embedded in the primordial plasma which would then collapse with the matter when galaxies form and uh, lead to magnetic fields we see in the galaxies. There is also a magnetic field observed in every cluster that we know. 
So galaxy clusters also have magnetic fields. They are at the level of 0.1 to 1 micro gauss, and they are also smooth or coherent over the extent of the cluster. Uh, here you see images made in optical and then X-ray and radio uh, bands. So uh, this is the coma cluster. And in the optical, you see a lot of shiny dots, which is a collection of galaxies. And then in the middle picture, you see X-rays, which show the radio, so the X-ray uh, emission from individual galaxies and also from the center of the cluster. And if you remove all the individual galactic sources, you're left with smooth emission, which is what you see on the right uh, image, which is indicative of this large scale smooth magnetic field permeating the galaxy cluster. So a cluster is a very big object. It's um, several, a few uh, sort of um, uh, million light years in extent. So it's, it's not very dense in these regions. It's, so the magnetic field there would be sustained by the plasma that fills the cluster. And again, there is some debate on whether the origin of such cluster fields could be astrophysical or it needs to be primordial. This is a more recent uh, image on the top right that you see. It's an image made by the low frequency array, LOFA experiment, which is uh, uh, an array of antennas primarily concentrated in the Netherlands, but with some components in the UK and other European countries. So they recently published um, this image made um, using synchrotron, made their observations of the synchrotron radio emission from two uh, galaxy clusters merging. And so uh, what you see in these colors is essentially uh, how um, strong and how uniform the, this emission is. And remember that synchrotron emission is indicative of a magnetic field. So they uh, suggest that there is a rather uniform magnetic field present over distances of three to 10 megaparsecs. So that's uh, megaparsec is roughly a million light years. So that's cosmological size distance. And uh, the same group that published this result in the paper, they tried to find a mechanism that could lead to such a magnetic field. So they did numerical modeling, uh, magnetohydrodynamic simulations. And uh, they concluded that primordial magnetic fields, if you were to start with magnetic fields already in the plasma, could naturally lead to such an arrangement. While with the astrophysical mechanisms that they could think of, it so far proved to be difficult. So at least uh, on the surface, that suggests, uh, that favors the primordial origin. Let me mention another piece of evidence. Let me just, thank you. <clears throat> another uh, interesting uh, evidence for primordial magnetic fields comes from cosmic rays. So we know there are all kinds of um, high energy um, photons and other types of particles hitting us. So about 10 years ago, uh, this paper claimed um, that they deduced uh, that there must be magnetic fields filling voids. So voids are the spaces which don't contain any concentrations of galaxies. So this, you could think of it as the space in between galaxy clusters. Um, so uh, the, the, the way they came to that conclusion was by observing blazars. Uh, they used the data from the Fermi satellite, which is um, uh, tasked with observing gamma rays. And uh, the idea is quite simple. Um, and let me explain because I think uh, it's uh, something you can appreciate. So what is a blazar? It's, um, it's a repeating source of very high energy photons, very high energy gamma rays by high energies tera electron volts. So that's uh, an, an enormous amount of energy. And the blazar would be coming from some active galactic nuclei in a galaxy far, far away, some hundreds of millions of light years away. And it would be some 
process near the black hole at the center of the galaxy that uh, triggers this emission. So as, it, as this photon travels to us, it will occasionally hit other photons. So the space is filled with all kinds of light, like EBL in this diagram denotes extra, extra galactic background light. So when you have two photons colliding at an extremely high energy, you could actually produce particles in that uh, collision. So just out of energy, you can produce electron and a positron, which are now two uh, particles of opposite electric charges, which continue uh, along the, the same direction that the blazer originally was uh, coming from. Now, as they propagate through space, they will eventually hit another photon, let's say a microwave background photon, and upscatter it, give it the boost to uh, GV level energy. So a thousand times smaller energy than a tera electron volt. And that's what you expect to see. So if you observed a laser, you also expect to see a halo of GV energy gamma rays around it. Okay, so that's what you would expect. The problem is that you don't see that. And then the question is, where did that halo go? And one explanation, which is the one proposed in that article that I mentioned earlier, was that once this electron and positron travel the space, if there is a magnetic field, charges deflect in the magnetic field and charges of different sign, positive and negative, would deflect in opposite ways. So they would deflect out of our line of sight and whatever uh, photons they would upscatter later, those GV level gamma rays, they would simply go out of our line of sight. So you would either not see a halo or you would see a halo that's spread out. It's much more diffuse than expected. And that's the kind of observation that's been seen. And since this claim 10 years ago, uh, the evidence has grown stronger. So it's a very intriguing observation indicating that magnetic fields also exist in seemingly empty space. Of course, the space is not empty. It's filled with plasma, but it's what we naively perceive as space empty in a sense that it doesn't contain any stars or galaxies. So let me uh, kind of summarize the observational evidence that we have. So as I mentioned, planet and stars do not need any primordial sources. It, it would be surprising if, the, if they did not have magnetic fields. Galaxies and clusters are more complicated. Uh, there is no uh, complete understanding how would um, magnetic fields in galaxies and clusters come about through pure astrophysics. So their primordial fields could be welcome. And then the blazars uh, support this uh, primordial idea. Although I should say that there are other proposals where you, know, you could imagine you know, this empty space is not really completely empty. There could be an occasional galaxy floating around. And if that galaxy had a supernova explosion, the galactic wind the, all the remnants could be expelled into the empty space and carry magnetic fields with them. So you could imagine magnetic fields being introduced into the voids through such explosive mechanisms. However, uh, there is no uh, story that there's no kind of a theory, an explanation that that's complete. And so uh, these are just um, speculations at the moment. On the other hand, if there was a primordial magnetic field, it would be quite welcome. Uh, there would still be astrophysics going on. However, there would be no puzzles. All of the magnetic fields, galaxies, clusters, and voids would be just explained in a simple way. So that's why a lot of people think about primordial magnetic fields as something interesting. And there is uh, the other side of the story, which is um, you know, just asking, where would magnetic fields come from? What in the early universe produced primordial magnetic fields? That by itself is a very interesting question. So what is this uh, 
uh, what is uh, the primordial hypothesis? So the idea is that magnetic fields would be produced in a very early universe before any structures began to form, when the universe was largely featureless, it was just gas or fluid, uh, then at that time it was fully ionized, so all the conditions for supporting a magnetic field would be there. So plasmas are, as I mentioned, are conducting, it's a, it is a conducting medium, and once you introduce a magnetic field in a conducting plasma, it attaches itself to it. It's like, imagine magnetic field lines attached to like particular points in the fluid. And as the fluid flows and moves, magnetic fields move with it. If the universe expands, which it does, magnetic fields expand with the universe. So their magnetic field lines become diluted with the plasma as the universe expands. Now, when it comes to forming galaxies, galaxies from uh, galaxies form from uh, gas that uh, falls into some pre-existing gravitational wells, and magnetic fields would be already embedded in that gas. So, as galaxies form, magnetic fields get compressed with the gas and provide the seed for the fields that we observe. So, it's a very simple mechanism that we can now understand. Of course, the big question is where would such primordial magnetic fields come from? So that brings me to the next part of my talk. Um, I see where would such fields come from? And related to that, can we actually ch check and we, if they were there in a very early universe, could we actually find proof of that? So um, here is a typical thing you see uh, in physics departments around the world, representing the history of the universe, starting from Big Bang, and then um, inflation, and then a universe that's expanding and cooling with all kinds of interesting things happening as it cools. So there are three epochs in the history of the universe that have been seriously studied by theoreticians um, during which magnetic fields could be produced. So the first one in a chronological order is inflation. The inflation is a period in the history of the universe where it's thought to have expanded exponentially fast. And during such an expansion, quantum fluctuations, so quantum uh, bubbling of fields, including magnetic fields, could be expanded and amplified. I'll, I'll come back to this in a minute. Another period is uh, the well-known uh, period, uh, which, is, uh, which corresponds to the electroweak transition. It's a transition from particles being massless to particles becoming massive. So you may remember about 10 years ago, uh, the Higgs boson was discovered at the Large Hadron Collider, named after Peter Higgs. And that's the epoch in the universe where the universe went through um, the kind of energy uh, transition in energy at which particles uh, acquired their masses through the Higgs mechanism. It's called the electroweak phase transition. And then there is another transition where quarks, which are the constituents of nuclei, particles making up nuclei, protons and neutrons. So quarks combine to form protons and neutrons. That's another uh, time during which the state of matter changed. So that's what a phase transition is. It's a, it's a change in a state of matter. So let me quickly go over these three epochs. Um, so what is, how does inflation produce magnetic fields? So for this, let's um, first uh, appreciate what happens at the very small scales at the quantum level. You probably heard about Heisenberg's famous uncertainty principle that uh, is often uh, described as a principle that says that you cannot know the position and the momentum of a particle uh, infinitesimally well. You cannot know where the particle is to arbitrary accuracy without giving up uh, information about its speed. And you cannot know how fast a particle is moving without giving up on knowing where it is precisely. So 
That's one way to formulate Heisenberg's principle, but that is more, it's actually more general. Um, nothing in, uh, in the physical world can be known to arbitrary accuracy. If you want to know anything, any, any, if you want to measure any quantity to arbitrary accuracy, you have to give up something. And that's not just a limitation of your measuring ability. It's a, it's, a, it's a fundamental property of how it works. So one consequence of that is that once you look at um, any particular thing at the microscopic level, you see it fluctuating. So this is quantum fluctuations, meaning nothing is perfectly smooth, including the space time. So our current ideas for where the structure in the universe comes from are based on this idea that <coughs> space-time intrinsically cannot be perfectly smooth. It has quantum fluctuations. And these quantum fluctuations were amplified during the period of inflation. So inflation has this uh, property of taking anything arbitrarily tiny and blowing it up to uh, cosmic proportions, including quantum fluctuations. So what used to be tiny becomes big. In addition, so there are two parts to this story. One is making them big, and the other one is preserving them so that they don't just go away. So when it comes to the curvature of space-time, it gets the quantum fluctuations in that curvature get amplified and frozen. So they later provide these gravitational potentials in which Meta congregates and results in galaxies that uh, we see. Um, with magnetic fields, the story starts in the same way. Quantum fluctuations also exist in all fields, including the electromagnetic field. And that gets amplified as well. But the part where it's supposed to get frozen and remain for us to observe or for us to detect, that part does not happen naturally. Uh, because electromagnetic fields behave very differently from the way the space-time behaves. So, but with some extensions of inflationary theories, you can build models in which this is possible. So just to summarize, there are ideas on how magnetic fields could originate through this quantum uh, origin during inflation, but it's an ongoing uh, work on the part of theories to come up with a compelling story, a compelling theory that would describe this. Now, the phase transitions, uh, you may know of phase transitions from your daily experience. One example, for example, is boiling, or the opposite process to boiling would be condensation. So um, when the universe went through its own phase transitions, when the state of matter of the universe changed, uh, you could have processes similar to condensation occurring. So you could, for example, uh, see bubbles, just like bubbles of water in this image. You could see bubbles of new state of matter forming in the early universe and expanding and occasionally colliding with other bubbles. And that creates turbulence. And what does turbulence do? As we mentioned earlier, in the case of galaxies, when you have plasma and you have turbulence, that creates magnetic fields. So this is a much less exotic way of producing magnetic fields in the early universe compared, for example, to the case of the inflation. However, it's not still um, clear whether uh, such bubbles could act, would actually form. So the, the physics of phase transitions in the early universe is not understood. And that's another uh, kind of um, topic of active research. But it's very intriguing. You probably uh, heard that in physics, there is a, a big unknown, which is the uh, puzzle concerning the origin of the asymmetry between matter and antimatter. Namely, why do we see more matter than antimatter? Most of the stuff we see around us in space is matter. But according to our physical theories, matter and antimatter are perfectly symmetrically possible. You could, there is nothing in our theory that distinguishes 
matter from antimatter. So why do we see more of matter than antimatter? And that uh, this theory is that attempt to explain this uh, asymmetry are very much related to theories that concern the origin of magnetic fields uh, at the time, for example, of the electro electroweak phase transition during the Higgs mechanism. So um, next, I guess you could ask if uh, there were magnetic fields in the early universe, how would we know that they were there? Uh, there are several uh, ways, uh, but more very broadly, um, they could be described as falling into two types. So magnetic fields have energy. And according to Einstein, energy has gravity. And this energy in a magnetic field would affect things that concern gravity. For example, the expansion of the universe would be different. It could be slightly faster at the, in the early universe if um, there, there was this additional energy in the magnetic fields. Uh, they could also, uh, these magnetic fields, because they are not uniform, they are inhomogeneous, they could also affect through their gravity some anisotropies that we observe in the cosmic microwave background. Also, this energy in a magnetic field dissipates. It, it loses, um, it, it, it converts into thermal energy on smaller scales. So it heats up the plasma and that alters the spectrum of this cosmic microwave background, which I'll mention in the beginning, uh, sorry, in a, in a couple of uh, moments. And then magnetic fields also speed up the process of recombination, which is another thing I'll mention in a second. So this brings me to this uh, topic of the Hubble tension. Um, you probably know that the universe is expanding and that was uh, convincingly shown by Edwin Hubble in 1929 in this paper where he made the famous Hubble diagram, which plots the velocity of distant galaxies uh, and their distance. And so it's a, on this plot, it looks like a straight line. And the slope of this line is the famous Hubble constant. So it's basically a constant relating the speed and the distance to the galaxy. We get the distances from, their, uh, from luminosities of known standard candles. So supernovae are thought to be such standard candles. You could also get distances from some things of known size. So if you observe the angular size on the sky and you know the physical size, you could determine the distance to that object. Um, and so there are these two ways of determining the distance. And then the velocity is determined through redshift or the uh, well-known Doppler shift, which is uh, of the galaxy or something that moves further away all the frequencies of the observed light are shifted. Um, so this Hubble constant has been measured to a very high accuracy recently. And as the accuracy of this measurement improved, a discrepancy appeared between different ways of measuring it. And this caused a, a great deal of excitement in, among the cosmologists like myself and also in, uh, in the media. It goes under all kinds of names like Hubble tension, Hubble trouble, uh, Hubble crisis, etc. And this started uh, from this paper led by Adam Rees, who's a Nobel Prize winning cosmologist, quite young, um, very active still. So he's working on this uh, improving measurements of the Hubble constant through his uh, this particular paper concerned uh, su supernovae based measurement where supernovae were calibrated on C feed variable stars. And they observed that uh, their measurement of the Hubble constant, which is 74 plus minus 1.4, is significantly different than what you learn from measurements of the cosmic microwave background. So um, let me just tell you how that is measured from the cosmic microwave background because um, that's how the connection to the magnetic field comes about. Um, so what is cosmic microwave background? If this is your typical poster, then the cosmic microwave background concerns 
uh, photons or light that come from this epoch. This is the epoch of recombination when electrons and protons have combined to form neutral hydrogen. So this is a pictorial way of seeing it. So before that, in the early universe, it was plasma. It was completely ionized. But after, most of it became neutral. So most of electrons and protons combined to form neutral hydrogen. And once the universe becomes neutral, it becomes transparent. After that, light can travel to us. So it's pretty much like the universe we see today. So if you are an astronomer, you don't think always of the universe as something on a logarithmic thermal scale. This is what astronomers actually see. They look out in space. And uh, what this epoch corresponds to is the transition from transparent to opaque. So you could imagine zooming out to a more and more distant universe with your radio telescopes. And eventually you stop seeing beyond the surface, which is the surface of recombination or the surface of last scattering as it's often called. So the image of the surface is what is, uh, is what cosmic microwave background radiation is. And so that's what we observe and it's measured to exquisite accuracy. This is a um, 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 recent, I don't know, about 10 years old measurement um, of the microwave sky by the Planck satellite, which is a European Space Agency satellite. It's um, on average is 2.7 Kelvin and it has a black body spectrum. So it's just the universe behaving like an oven. It's a perfectly black, uh, blood body spectrum. So it's like us being in the middle of a hot oven, except it's not very hot anymore because the universe is, has expanded a lot since then. So all the temperatures have cooled uh, to only 2.7 Kelvin. And what you see in this image is not the average temperature, but tiny imperfections, tiny fluctuations around the average, one part in 100,000. And there's a lot of information in this. In particular, these fluctuations in the temperature contain, um, Im contain um, the imprints of sound waves, so wobbling around of plasma that existed before the universe turned transparent. So before recombination, protons, electrons, and photons formed one tight fluid and that fluid had sound waves, which were triggered by gravitational potentials. And when the universe turned transparent, it happened quite suddenly but that uh, compared to other time scales. So that sudden um, change preserved the image of the sound waves and for us to see in a microwave sky and also in the distribution of galaxies. It's not easy to see these oscillations by just looking at such pictures, but you can clearly see them if you do the Fourier analysis. If you, for example, study plots like this, which um, in very general terms represent how, uh, kind of how strong temperature fluctuations are uh, on different angular scales. So the these peaks that you see are called acoustic peaks, and they are caused by the sound waves in the primordial plasma. So this brings us to the Hubble constant. A measurement of a typical size of um, or the wavelength of the sound waves at the time of uh, recombination is uh, telling us, um, um, so it can help us determine the Hubble constant. So the idea is that we build a triangle. So when we observe cosmic microwave background, it tells us where, what the angle of the sound horizon, uh, what the angle corresponding to the sound horizon that recombination is. So it tells us the angle. And then we can use known physics to calculate what that sound horizon should be. So that tells us the linear size. So if you know the actual linear size, and if you know the angular size, you can then deduce the distance. And the distance, as we know, depends on how fast the universe is expanding, and that leads to an estimate of a Hubble constant. 
That's in the very broad terms how you deduce the Hubble constant from CMB. And if in this triangle, the sound horizon happened to be smaller, as in this uh, dotted line, then you know, the angle is fixed. That's what we observe. We cannot change that. But if the physical size happened to be smaller, it would lead to a smaller distance to that epoch. And that would imply a smaller Hubble constant. OK, I realize that I'm coming close to the end of my uh, period of time, so it's, I only have a couple of minutes left. I hope that's OK. So this is uh, how the measurement of the Hubble constant evolved over the last couple of decades. When I was starting my career as a cosmologist, uh, there's two ways of measuring the Hubble constant using direct way that Hubble did or how Adam Rees and his collaborators do using C feeds, for example. Uh, that was quite um, uncertain. And CMB as well was had fairly large uncertainties. But with time, ac the accuracy of both measurements became very good. And this difference has emerged um, with, and now has become um, a problem. Um, and th there is this other uh, measurements of the Hubble constant. There is this general discrepancy. Like all the measurements that rely on a model of recombination tend to give you a smaller value of H naught. And all the measurements that do not depend on a model to describe what happens in the early universe, they give you higher measurements. So that suggests that there may be something missing in our model that describes recombination, and that's where magnetic fields come from. So what do magnetic fields do to help? So if you have magnetic fields in the primordial plasma, uh, magnetic fields are inhomogeneous. So they are slightly, they have more energy or less energy in different parts in space. And that has the effect on plasma that plasma would tend uh, to congregate in regions of lower magnetic energy density. And because of this congregation, the process of recombination of electrons and protons forming neutral hydrogen, it will proceed more efficiently. And so the whole thing of recombination would happen faster and complete at an earlier time. And that reduces that length that I mentioned earlier, the sound horizon, that is key to determining the Hubble constant from cosmic microwave background. Okay, so it has this uh, impact on the magnetic, uh, on the cosmic microwave background spectrum. It shifts all the peaks, as you can see on this picture. And that shift then can be compensated by making the Hubble constant larger. And so this is uh, another visual way of seeing it. So the vertical band is the measurement by Adam Rees and company. Uh, horizontal band is a measure of another parameter that is also in somewhat tension, concerns the clustering, the amount of clustering of matter in the universe. And you can see that with the magnetic field, which is this M1 model in our notation, uh, you move to a much better agreement with the observation. So it's a fairly recent paper that I wrote with my collaborator, Karsten Udamzik, who is uh, working in France in, in Montpellier. And the interesting thing is that if you look at the kind of magnetic fields that you need to resolve the Hubble tension and compare them to the other known observational constraints on primordial magnetic fields coming from things like the Big Bang nuclear synthesis, or BBN, uh, FR stands for Faraday rotation. These are the blazars. Um, so the, this, uh, this uh, square labeled MW for Milky Way represents the kind of magnetic fields you need to explain the magnetic fields in galaxies like the Milky Way. So and on a y-axis here is, uh, is the strength of the magnetic field on a particular, over a particular length lambda and the x-axis is a typical sort of length. You can think of the extent over which you average your magnetic field. And the dotted line is the prediction of inflationary magnetogenesis models. The dashed line 
is the prediction of phase transition models. So uh, if you ask what is the magnetic field that you need to explain the Hubble tension, it's amazingly falls in right into the middle of that square. And so that, needless to say, is very exciting for us. So this prompted um, some interest um, in, over the past couple of years, uh, including this article from which I borrowed the image that I sent to Marcus. And this article uh, is uh, quite well written, in my opinion, which summarizes the current state of observations and um, uh, why people think of primordial magnetic fields. Also, it talks about the Hubble tension as well. So um, these ideas uh, that I just mentioned will be tested um, to a greater, much greater accuracy with the upcoming uh, observations. So the three things to look forward to are the square kilometer array, which is a huge array, as, as the name suggests, square kilometer. Uh, built uh, simultaneously in Australia and South Africa. Uh, this is a collection of radio telescopes. And then two cosmic microwave background uh, observatories. One is the Simons Observatory, which is being built in Chile. And CMBS-4 is a more distant proposal, which would be the successor of the Simons Observatory, which is going to be a collection of CMB telescopes both in Chile and at the South Pole. And they will have the capability between them to confirm the existence of primordial magnetic fields if they, are, if they were really there at the level that I described that, for example, would help us solve the Hubble tension, or they would severely constrain them to the point that you know, they would likely uh, not be very interesting. So uh, this brings me to the end of my talk. I, uh, I hope you did not mind me going a bit over time. So to summarize, um, the space around us is full of magnetic fields. We see them in pretty much every gravitationally bound structure, like planets, stars, galaxies, clusters. But we also see them in empty space. And all of these uh, sightings of magnetic fields could be explained if they were already present in the early universe. But they may not be necessary. So uh, I want to emphasize again: we don't, uh, we cannot exclude pu purely astrophysical origins of all these fields. It's just that a primordial field would make it, uh, in a way, much easier to explain all of them in one one go. And then we have things to look forward to uh, that will uh, confirm or rule out you know, these ideas that I mentioned. So thank you for your attention, and I'm looking forward to your questions. OK, well, thank you for that uh, fascinating talk. It covered huge um, areas that I was not very familiar with at all, and I'm most grateful to you for explaining them so clearly to us. I've taken a lot of notes, but I'm going to have to uh, look at the um, video when it comes up, not on Facebook, please. I'm sorry, I misled you, uh, but on YouTube. Um, and uh, Annie will passing on the details of how to get onto that. Um, so um, there's a chat. Here we are. Uh, no, I thought there was a question coming up there, but it's not on the chat line. So can I ask? Um, uh, our participants to come up with a question. Otherwise, I'll have to come up with a question. But you should go first. Um, so let's see. Here we are. Something coming up. From Stephen King. I'll read it. When Beerman battery seeding was simulated, what magnitude of field was produced? And why doesn't this add to a primordial field resulting in a difference between young and old galaxies? In other words, why don't we see astrophysical generated fields? Um, so there are Beerman uh, batteries, uh, battery uh, type uh, simulations performed in the context uh, of 
um, actual proto galaxies, and there are also simulations performed um, corresponding to uh, an earlier epoch in the history of the universe. For example, the epoch um, of ionization, which is something that happened at redshifts of about 10 to 15. And at different epochs, the kind of seed magnetic fields that you get are different. Um, I would struggle to give you a um, particular number. It would be a very tiny seed, let's say on the order of 10 to minus 20 gauss. And that would, nor that would be enough. So something like 10 to minus 20 or 10 to minus 21 gauss would be enough to see the magnetic field of a galaxy like uh, the Milky Way. Um, for a much younger galaxy, which only had a handful of turns, you would need seed field on the order of 10 to minus 14 Gauss, which is much larger. And to the best of my knowledge, and I should say I'm not an expert on um, sort of simulations of Beerman batteries, but to the best of my knowledge, this is too strong. So 10 to minus 14 would be a problem to produce through a Beerman battery. See the questions. Marcus, you're yeah. muted. Yes. Okay, I'm unmuted now. Um, still waiting for more questions to come in, so maybe think about it while I try and uh, um, understand something which uh, I'm going to put to our speaker. Um, you said that magnetic energy dissipates into heat. Now, so many um, reactions can work the other way. So is it possible that heat can produce magnetic energy? Um, of course you can. So if you have gradients or differences of temperature mm. if, if, from one part of space to another, that would produce flows of gas and flows of ionized gas would produce magnetic fields. Yeah. But the kind of dissipation I'm talking about concerns tiny scale. So if you think of the plasma, so on very large, over large distances, you can think of it as one conducting fluid and magnetic fields are just embedded in that fluid. But once you start going to smaller scales, like scales you can think of interparticle scales or scales on which relative motion of the particles making up the plasma becomes important. On those scales, magnetic fields can cause motion of particles. So they convert energy in the magnetic field into the kinetic energy of actual particles. That happens on small scales. Mm. So they will gradually lose their energy on small scales while preserving their overall structure and energy over big scales over the sort of size of the universe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's okay. what I'm so they would pump energy into heat. They would heat up the plasma through this motion, generating motion of particles on small scales. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, do we have any more questions? No open questions yet. We've got 20 people looking, so come on now. We've got uh, any, we can, we can keep this going for another five minutes, can we not? And he's... Um, I'm oh. here. Um, yeah. Yes, we, yeah, Any, that's fine. We, Nobody else is using it because it's obviously quite long after office hours now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we appreciate that. Um, but don't forget, it's still morning in Vancouver. Um, yeah, so any other questions uh, or, or um, clarifications that you might need? Hmm. Well, there are 20 people scratching their heads. Um. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of, a lot of uh, physics in, to, to digest in such a short time. I think what? you're right. There is a lot of, a lot of physics there. But you set it out very clearly, and I was scribbling notes all the time, and I'm going to compare my notes with 
uh, the um, the YouTube um, session when I get round to it. Yeah, uh, I was just going to say it's really great that we've recorded it because lots of friends who weren't able to make it this evening will be able to watch it. And yes, and, absolutely. You know, if that's okay with you, perhaps we could forward any questions on that we receive. Uh, we could. Fine. Yeah, I'd be happy to answer them in writing. Really. Okay, that, that's a very good idea, um, Annie. Thank you for that. Uh, we mentioned that when we pass the the in, uh, joining information on for um, uh, the YouTube. Well, um, it really remains to me to uh, thank you again uh, for a fascinating talk. It has covered so much ground and so much new stuff. Uh, I think we're really um looking at that as something which uh, will provide a lot of uh uh energy uh for us uh, uh look, trying to work out what is happening uh, at the beginning of the universe um now um this is uh, our penultimate talk this year our final talk will be on the 2nd of december at the usual time of 1 p.m. and details will be posted at the end of this month. So thank you all for watching and thank you again Professor Pogotsian for taking all the time and energy in preparing this uh, detailed and fascinating talk. Many thanks. You're welcome and thanks for inviting me. It was a pleasure.